What if I told you that consciousness creates reality? In my opinion, this is one of the lost books of success. You never hear anyone talking about it. It's almost forgotten. This book was written by Miss Elizabeth Town in 1904. And this information still rings true today. This book touches on perseverance, self-confidence, goal setting, positive thinking, persistence, personal growth, mindset shift, visualizations, and affirmations. It even touches on time management, building relationships, and of course, financial success. Let this audio be playing in the background while you do other things such as driving, cleaning the house, studying. Soak up this information because success really is your birthright. I even included a list of affirmations just to condition the mind for success. Enjoy. This is Justin. Chapter 1. Success, what is success? Success is not money, nor is it fame. The king in the ancient fable turned to gold all that he touched and starved to death. The sick man of the East has wealth galore and worldwide fame, but so abjectly afraid is he that he is never a moment alone, never tastes a dish that has not first been tried on a menial, and springs to his feet with pistol in hand if his best friend across the table happens to make a quick movement. Money and power he has, but not success. Success is liberty to command, a coupled with a clear conscience and loving heart. William Gladstone was a success, Abraham Lincoln was another. Few men attain so complete a success as theirs. Jesus of Nazareth was a success, though most people imagine he was poor. He was not. He wore seamless robes and fine linen and fared sumptuously in many elegant homes where he was more liberty to command than were the masters themselves. Nothing was too good for Jesus. To own all those homes would be a burden Jesus was too wise to assume. Liberty to command must not be overworked, lest it cease to be liberty and become the drudgery of taking care of things. A successful man is not necessarily a rich man, but he is a man who can command all he desires. Among money kings it is said, Jay, Kierpont Morgan is not rated a very rich man, but he commands more money than any other man in the world. It is said men confide in him because of his fine business sense gained by using his own judgment, and because he does exactly what he agrees to. He never asks advice, and he keeps his mouth shut unless he has something special to say. Then he says it, in the simplest and fewest words possible. This is concentration, the mode of success. Money is not success, but success includes the power to command money. Success includes the liberty to command money, enough to gratify all one's aspirations to better his own condition, and the condition of those dependent upon him, this does not mean that success includes money enough to enable one to outshine his neighbor. No man with that aim in life was ever successful or ever will be. Not to outshine, but to shine upon his neighbors is the successful man's mission. Success is alive it germinates, sprouts, and grows. It grows first underground. In due time it appears and keeps on unfolding. It is just as easy to grow success as to grow potatoes, Yes, it is easier, for success will grow out of potatoes, and it will grow where potatoes won't. There is not a spot on earth, or in heaven, or hell, that will not serve to sprout success in not one. Success may outgrow a place and need transplanting, but it will sprout anywhere, and at any time. Potatoes must be started at a certain time. The time to plant and tend success is now. You plant potatoes and you know they will grow, you go off and do something else whilst they germinate and sprout. You can't see them grow, but you know they are growing. And whilst you are working away at other things, you have a nice little warm glow in your heart over the fine crop that is coming on out there in the tatter patch. 
You love that patch. You planted it just as well as you could with the best seed potatoes, and you are proud of it even before there is the first peep of green. When that comes, your love increases. You hoe every hill carefully and you take good care of the bugs. In due time, you exhibit some of those spuds at the state fair and you get a prize. And at last, you command more money for your potatoes than others get for theirs. Now, do you imagine you had no success until you got the gold for those potatoes? Then you are greatly mistaken. You planted success with every blessed tater hill. You loved it and beamed on it, hoed the weeds away, picked the bugs off, and reveled in success all summer long. You lived on success all summer. Perhaps you say, oh, that is a very pretty picture, but my potato patch was a failure. Then you planted failure with your potatoes. When you were plowing and planting and hoeing, you were telling yourself all the time that there is no use. Nothing ever did well for you. It seemed to be your lot to drudge and pinch and worry along and never have anything. There is John Smith over the way you. He can take it easy and have fine stock and hire men to do the drudgery whilst you surround and bosses. And here you are. Everything is against you. Damn the stones on this land, anyhow. Your spuds never do well. Ground is no good. Why can't you take it easy like other folks? And so on. Ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Your mind meanders. Whilst you, with less than half a heart, get through the drudgery any old way. Just so you get through. Potatoes are not the only thing you planted. You planted thoughts in every hill. You cursed every hill you planted cursed it with mean thinking. You planted failure, and you will reap the failure you planted. Every idle thought will bring its meat of failure and subtract from the money that might have been yours. It takes the finest seed potatoes, good land and thinking to match, to ensure a good crop and good prices. The successful man puts his thought into his work, the unsuccessful one turns his thought away from it as if when he was supposed to be watering his garden, he should turn the stream over the fence into the road, leaving his garden dry and gasping. You must love and think about your work if you are to make a success of it and make it pay. Blessed is that man who hath found his work. If you are doing work you dislike, you will not succeed, and all the treatments in creation can't make you succeed. Get into line with a work you do love, something in which you can express yourself, if you think you must remain where you are, then put your interest, your love, yourself, into that business. One touch of yourself will make business go. A young man laid in coal, opened shop, placed his card in the local paper, and sat down to wait for custom that did not come. When he went home to dinner one day, his wife remarked that she had a headache, which had been aggravated by the noise of putting in coal at the next house, that young man went to the newspaper office and added a line to his A.D. coal, delivered without noise. He delivered his coal in sacks. Yes, delivered it. One touch of himself did the business and he was customless no longer. A man's success is measured on the unseen side by the amount of love he feeds his work with. And on the seen side, it is measured by money. I do not mean that the amount of money a man manages to corner by fair means or foul, his own or his father's, is the measure of his success. Not at all. But the amount of real love a man puts into his work determines exactly the amount of money he or some other man can get out of it. If he respects himself and the rest of mankind, if he knows that justice rules now, really knows it, he will himself get the money. If he knows just what mean and grasping liars men, he attracts men who will rob him of the money due his work. But in either event, he is at the bottom of the whole business. The individual himself is lord of his own circumstances. Circumstances and other men are puppets in his hands. As a man realizes this, he moves circumstances and people at will by pulling the right strings in himself. Goodwill you must love people in order to be able to move them. You must be able to see them as they see themselves, and you must meet them heartily. Love is not sentimental gush. Love is not a self-announcer. Love is divine emotion, that which moves outward from the point where the universal meets the personal. Love manifests in the person as pure goodwill. It shines in his face, beams from his eyes and impels his every action. 
The successful man is a man of pure goodwill. Remember, success is the liberty to command, coupled with a clear conscience and loving heart. In proportion as a man is possessed of goodwill, his conscience is clear. Goodwill is the outward moving power of a loving heart. Only such a heart ever has liberty to command. In proportion as a man succeeds in letting good will flow outward to each person, thing or circumstance with which he comes in touch, in that proportion will he be able to influence persons, things and circumstances according to his will, his good will, which is just to all. The art of succeeding is the art of concentrating good will and using it for definite purposes. He that doubteth and yet doth directs evil will, not good will, and he is condemned in his own soul. Not only that, but he will reap outwardly what he has sown, evil will. Good will must go out to all mankind, collectively and individually. A single grudge is a worm in the bud of your success. Send out such positive, definite, personal goodwill that a grudge finds no room to grow by eating out your heart and success. It is your grudge that has the power to destroy your success. Your grudge against person, place, work, or fate. Spray your soul daily, hourly, with goodwill, and withhold not the spray from thy neighbor. The essentials, the essentials of success are these, one, goodwill toward all. This includes justice, honesty, a clear conscience, and a loving heart. Two, an aim, a stake to be reached, 3. Eternal stick to it iveness 4. Concentration of thought and effort upon the details of reaching the stake set. A man's aim in life is the reflection of his opinion of himself. A man with a pretty low opinion of himself has no aim at all. He feels himself merely a fallen twig born helplessly on the bosom of life. Wake up, dearie. Exalt yourself and set your stake just as high as you dare. Then, as you find you can face your stake with a feeling that you are really going to make it after all, congratulate yourself upon your soul stature and move your stake higher. Listen to what somebody of the name of Buxton has said about the third essential to success. The longer I live, the more I am certain that the great difference between men, between the feeble and the powerful, the great and the insignificant, is energy invincible determination, e, a purpose once fixed, and then death or victory. That quality will do anything that can be done in this world. And no talents, no circumstances, no opportunities will make a two-legged creature a man without it. And Ella Wheeler Wilcox says, there is no chance, no destiny, no fate, can circumvent or hinder or control. The firm resolve of a determined soul Another has said, All things are possible to him that believeth. And I say unto you, Go and win and stick to it. Concentration of thought upon the details of getting there. You can't afford to waste thought upon grumblings and resentments against individuals, circumstances, or fate. Jan may imagine you have brains enough to divide between your work and these petty fault findings and resentments. But you have not. Every idle thought subtracts a definite amount from your success and your cash. Put your thought into business. This does not mean you are never to think of anything but business, but it does mean that you are never to separate thought from goodwill. Whatever you can think of with goodwill will aid you to self-expression, will increase your power. Concentrate on the detail of getting there. I was once lost above the snow line on a great mountain and had to retrace my steps upward to the point where I had taken the wrong trail. I was so anxious to get to that point that my whole soul seemed to leap upward and away toward that place leaving me so utterly paralyzed that I was actually unable to take a step. In a few moments I collected myself and put my thought into the climbing when I made the distance easily and quickly. Where the thought runs ahead like that the will, the real motive power of the body, actually goes out of the body, leaving it unable to accomplish what is expected of it. When you are doing something, put your thought into it, will follows thought, and thus you work easily and effectively. When you are relaxed and resting, you may without injury, let thought take any flight. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. That is with all of the I thought and will, as well as hands. Work done in this way actually rejuvenates the body. 
whilst a scattered mind scatters or disintegrates the body. You are a unit, A1. Work as a one, never fear. Fear fear is a great bugaboo and like moat bogies, he is merely a shadow. No amount of fear will hinder your success if you will keep your eye on the stake you have set and keep sticking to it mentally, fears or no fears. When I ride the wheel, I see stones to be avoided. If I look at one and say to myself, I am afraid, I'll probably run over it. Then I go over it every time. But I may have more fear, it may be a larger stone. But if I say to myself, I shall go around that, I invariably go around it. It is the word, the mental statement, that determines whether I miss or hit those stones. I have proven by hundreds of careful observations that fear has absolutely nothing to do with it. I may be scared blue over something. I may not be able to keep my eyes off the obstacle. But if I affirm resolutely, I shall miss that. I miss it every time. Our bodies are just bundles of mental statements, which are being hourly augmented and revised by more statements. It is these mental statements that incite motion. Every thought sends vibrations clear to the tips of the nerves and on out through the personal and universal auras. Every thought incites corresponding muscular activity. Mind reading is really muscle reading, as Dr. Parkin claims. Fear literally has no power over your body, except as you state to yourself that it has. Deny it, deny that fear has power. Make persistent mental statements of what you desire. Make them in the face of fear until fear tucks his tail betwixt his legs and gets off the earth. Kate Bome gives this sentence to her students to concentrate upon, I am open on my inner side to the inexhaustible ocean of divine love and power. I flow forth from it and am one with it. All success is mine through the working of this power. I shall succeed in all my undertakings. Be still and know. Chapter 2. Money Making Please treat me that I may be useful to the world. I will trust the money to follow. All right, you will find the money following, but it will follow such a long way off that you will never see it except in some other body's possession. Make me useful to the world is the cry of self-depreciation. It presupposes that you are now a weak, useless piece of furniture. As you think of yourself so the world thinks, just so long as you carry that prayer in your heart, just so long will you remain weak and useless in your own esteem, which the world will continue to reflect. The world has an eye to the main chance. If you think you are worth little to the world, the world will not fall over itself to lay its coin at your feet. It will take all you can give, and when you've nothing more to give it, will dump the remains in the potter's field. Possibly it may beautify its parks and soothe its conscience with a monument inscribed to you when you are well out of the way. And it may hold memorial services where it will congratulate itself on the bargain it got out of you. But pay you? Never. Not a cent will you get beyond what you really think in your heart you are worth to the world. Ungrateful? Hard, wrong, not at all. The world is governed by the immutable law that as a man thinketh so he is. And the world is too wise to give gold for nothing. Every man gets just as much gold out of the world as he puts into it. All things are thought made. Every man must think his own gold into being. Or to turn it around that we may get a clearer view. There is money enough in existence, but each individual must stake his claim and then work it. The writer of those lines at the head of this article has never staked her claim. She trusts the world to give her money ready-made in return for services, which she thinks are of little or no value, but which she insists upon giving. This is the beggar spirit pure and simple and leads down to the depths of poverty. It is the same spirit that rules India, the spirit of self-depreciation, of self-effacement, the spirit which regards the individual as merely a microbe among teeming millions. The spirit of little I and big you. Big I, I and little you is not a pretty spirit, but enshrined in the hearts of those starving millions, he would have risen up and demanded as his right the sustenance, which for centuries these poor little I people have been denying themselves. Not the British big I is to blame for these conditions, but the Indian little I. In our country, it is not the big I corporations, trusts, or individuals who are the cause of squalor and wretchedness. 
it is the little eye in the working man. The only cure for poverty of mind or body is to educate the individual little eye until he grows up. These pinched conditions are necessary to wake up the individual to his own IMM. His big eye, every man gets the mental claim he stakes, works and sticks to. Who ever heard of a rich man who never aimed to be rich? Many a man aims and falls short, stakes his claim and then gives it up because it is too hard work or fate is against him. But not one ever makes his stake without first setting his stake. This is all in his mind, but what is in his mind may, by persevering effort, come into visibility. There are a few people in the world who seem to be exceptions to this rule, but you may depend upon it, they only seem. Every blessed accomplishment any human being evidences came in the same way, by desiring a definite thing and then putting forth intelligent, persistent effort in that direction. If you find a man to whom things come easy, you may rest assured that in some prior state of existence, he has staked his claim and put forth all the intelligent, repeated efforts necessary to work it. He has served his apprenticeship and mastered his art in some previous incarnation. In this incarnation, he does it easily, and the world wonders. This is just as true of a Carnegie or a Rockefeller or Albert Hubbard as it is of a musical or an art genius. There is no royal road to anything. Somewhere, somehow, sometime, every man must learn all things by his own persistent effort. And financiering is one of the all things. Yes, he must learn to make money, literally to make money out of himself. Do you rebel at must? Well, you might if another compelled you. But it is the law of your being which says, I desire it, and desire is the law. You desire wealth, money, the ability to gratify your desires, but you want to cling to your old eftation that money is filthy lucre and not as noble an object of effort as the good of mankind. Oh, you dear dunce, money is the measure of the good you can do mankind. Without money, you can do nothing. But hire yourself out to some other man for bread and dudes. With money, you can do anything. What your money cannot give to the world directly, it will enable you to give to the world. It will give you time in which to devote ideas and love to the world. If desire for money has been born in the midst of your poverty, bless it and cherish it and let it grow up. Don't starve it upon such watery sentimentality, pap, as, oh, I wish we didn't have to have money. I'd so much rather be doing good to the world than working for money. If you were doing good that the world wants of you, it would hasten to pay you money. That's the trouble with folks who are always wailing to do good. They want to do good their way, never remembering that the world might object to their way. The world is perfectly willing you shall do good to your corner as much as you please. But until you get your own cornership shape, the world objects to your meddling with it. If you do, you'll find yourself on a rocky road. When you get your own corner cozy and pretty, as an example of what you can do, then the world will come and gaze and ask you to tell how you did it. The world will even offer you $1,000 or so for a short magazine article on how you did it or how you'd advise other folks to do. The world wants the ideas of a man who has demonstrated something for himself. No. This is not because the world worships money at all. It don't. It worships ideas and it will give all the gold it has for ideas externalized. As long as ideas remain in imagination, they are not worth the second-hand clothes and coarse grub of the imaginer. Let that imaginer get a move on and externalize his thinks and the world shells out in a hurry. The money you attract is the exact measure of value of the ideas you have succeeded in externalizing. If you have invented something or other and sold your idea for a pittance to somebody else, you needn't grumble because he is getting the money. He deserves it. It is as if you had given away or sold your baby at the hour of birth. He has raised your child. He has done more than ever you did toward making useful to the world your idea. So he gets a greater measure of money if you go about giving your ideas a literal piece of your mind. To the world at every turn, you will never get beyond the second-hand clothes stage. Other people may pick up your ideas and make money on them. Well, you needn't feel robbed. You were too lazy to do anything but talk. Some people, the I want to do good to the world kind, 
are prolific of ideas perhaps, but they let somebody else incubate them and send them to market. Learn to think for cash, keep mum, value your ideas, take good care of them, keep your mouth shut so they don't catch cold. So when you've honed a new idea, keep your eye on him. Don't let him get away until he is fit to be seen. Then present him to the world for value received. This is a fine art and one that repays care and persistence and all the intelligence you can bring to bear. To make money, you must make ideas practical to the world. Making ideas practical is self-expression. Self-expression is the mode of external life, growth, health, success, joy. Go in to win. There isn't a greater, grander, more godlike thing to do than to make money. Chapter 3. Now and Then Discouragement is due to just one cause, letting the mind run on one thing whilst you are doing another. At such times, you are a house divided against itself, and you are falling. You are a stream of energy running in two channels instead of one, and you are therefore too weakened to accomplish anything in either channel, and you feel weak and discouraged. You are practicing mental scatteration, which is the way not to live. You are living in the death part of your consciousness, and your body is actually disintegrating whilst you are doing it. You are letting go your life, your individuality. You are letting your desire and your will, which are all one force and the only one, spread out all over creation. You are allowing yourself to be pulled to pieces by conflicting centers of attraction outside you. You are become the puppet of environment for the time being. Of course, it don't feel good. It is an unnatural state, a painful state, to be in. And you don't have to be there a single minute. Only your own ignorance can keep you there. You are a center of attraction with greater force than is in all your environment beside. You can literally pull yourself together and become master instead of puppet. And it is the easiest thing in the world to do it, and the most natural. So natural that the tiniest infant can do it and does it habitually. Living is the art of adjusting oneself to the now. Whatever one is really adjusted to one enjoys. Whenever one is not enjoying, it is because he is hanging with one hand to the now and with the other to the fleeting past or is straining out to the now is the only point one can become thoroughly adjusted to the only place one can really enjoy. And the only way one can enjoy the now is to put all of himself into it so that there is no straining out in the different directions. One no sooner becomes comfortably adjusted to the now than the now changes. Well, let it change and do thou likewise. Readjust as now readjusts. Let go what is fleeting away, accept what is arriving, and get interested in cuddling comfortably down into it. Dearie, this is something that is all in your mind. Keep adjusting your mind to things as they come. Of course, you will have a lot of desires that certain particular things come. Well, every blessed one of those desired things will come. Desire is the index to the book of life. Just read the index and smack your lips over the good things that are coming in, that big book, and then settle down to enjoy every one of the chapters as it comes. I know lots of folks think they must dip into the last chapter first, and then they lose interest in what comes before and skip slightingly over it all. They don't get half the pleasure of the book, but the book of life is a serial story, and you can't get at the last chapter first. Fortunately, for you, so don't try. Just glance over the index, your desires, and then cuddle comfortably down with each chapter as it comes. Enjoy it. And then enjoy the next and the next. What is the use anyway in eternally hashing over the table of contents of our lives? Lots of us look backward continually and dwell upon the hard places. Why? Just because we want to be pitied and made much over. Because we want somebody to get down with us and wail over the terrible things we have been through. Or if we have been through some nice things, we want folks to weep with us. Because the particular chapter we are now giving the small part of our attention to isn't quite so nice. It is astonishing how determined we are to weep and make other folks weep over our book of life. We are so set on sympathy that we don't even see one-tenth of the good cheer and fun and frolic and real wit that is so plentifully besprinkling every book of life. We pass over the good things because we don't half read the now chapter. Then, if we have perchance grown tired of looking over the table of contents of our past lives, we go stumbling over the future. 
we study our desires assiduously, but we don't believe them. We fret and strain after them, all the while fearing that the book will not give us what the index promises. C. So we fail to make the best of what goes before, and we postpone the day of getting to the thing desire promises, or when we get there we don't half enjoy it because we have failed to pay attention to what went before. Now, dearie, this is no joke and no meaningless figure of speech. It is a literal fact, as solid as any rock that ever grew. You never strive and strain over the table of contents of any printed book you never doubt that it will all be in the book, so you get comfortably to work at the beginning and read one chapter at a time until you get to the supreme climax. Your desires are just as accurate and trustworthy an index to what is coming. Then let it come and enjoy the vicissitudes by which it comes. Cuddle comfortably down with the now chapter and pay attention to each thing as it turns up. That is the way to get there. See? Chapter 4 united we achieve? Do I believe in turning all the attention upon each detail of everyday work? Yes. Pour all your thought into this piece of work until you can do it to perfection and with joy. As long as you have irksome tasks or drudgery, you may rest assured it is because you have not yet put in interested thought enough. This is the finest concentration practice in the world. Just to put your whole soul into the one thing you are doing, when you have used this practice long enough, you will do the thing beautifully and with joy. About this time, you will find your thought force has flowed into this work and filled it full of energy and is overflowing. You will take happy little mental flights away from your work. Little inspirations will come to you, and always your thought will come back to your work with joy. Suppose your work just now is five-finger exercises, learning to use your fingers. If you put all your thought into each movement, you will make each accurately. If you let your mind wander ever so little your fingers follow, your exercises will be slovenly because your thought is divided and you haven't enough to bear dividing. If you practice with a divided mind, it will take you five times as long to accomplish the art of using your fingers and you will never use them to the best advantage. I hear daily someone across the street practicing scales she runs one scale nicely because she thinks about it. After that, I can read her wandering half-mind in those slovenly, uneven runs. I can tell when she is pleased or not, and I know the very instant she thinks of something nice she is going to do when she gets through that hour of drudgery. You see her fingers are trying to express a divided mind, so their action is uncertain and will always be so unless she mends her mind and turns it all into her fingers until her fingers are full to overflowing. When this happens, the thought flows or overflows in beautiful fancies which the forgers are ready to express. And all is pleasure. Do you see now what concentration upon daily tasks is for? To fill your members, the different parts of your body, with loving intelligence in expressing thought. The everyday tasks set you in the school of life are the scales and five finger exercises that you must put your soul into mastering before that soul can express anything more beautiful in the way of life symphonies. There is a vast difference between putting all your thought into an action until you can do it subconsciously, and your thought is freed on a higher plane and the common way of putting half, or less, of your thought energy into drudgery done in a slipshod, ungraceful fashion whilst the main body of your thought goes gallivanting around where it has no business to be. Thought is vitalizing, energizing. When you try to work with half your thoughts switched off and out of your activities, you rob and devitalize your body. To a fully vitalized body, every act is joy. Whenever your work is drudgery, stop short. Call your thought home. Take three or four very slow, full breaths of fresh air. Straighten up to do it then quietly turn all your thought into your actions. Every time you catch it wandering again, bring it quietly, but firmly, back to business. This is the sort of concentration that gives self-command and fits you to think higher thoughts and fill higher places. And the moment you are ready, the omnipresent law of attraction will whisk you into place. Chapter 5. I want, and I un I want so many things, or rather I want to be so many things, 
to be thoroughly healthy, beautiful, magnetic, cultured, a brilliant conversationalist, etc. I want lots of pretty clothes, beautiful things around me, money to gratify my ambitions. I am bewildered to know what to work at first. I am a clerk and have so little time to work at these things outside. Don't you know the whole human race wants just those things? And don't you know that the whole human race is growing them? And all the unseen powers, the real powers, of the universe are working with the human race for the attainment of all that. And all the powers seen and unseen are working for your attainment of them, and working just as whole solidly, steadily, and effectually as if you were the only creature in all creation. It is the working of these unseen powers in and through you that gives you the desire for such things. It is not your desire alone that is calling for these things. It is the whole universe calling through you, and all the powers of earth and heaven, yes, and hell too, will work through you to manifest them. All the powers are working through you now to manifest them. You are not a separate and distinct creation rolling around loose in the world. You are a part of the whole APA part that has its own peculiar position and uses in the economy of the whole. And in all creation, there is, never has been, and never will be a duplicate of you. If you get misplaced in the world, or if you are not properly polished and beautified, it is not you alone who suffer. The whole travails in pain until you are satisfied and satisfying. Until you fit in and glory in your fitness and beauty. The entire universe besters itself to help you fit in and be happy. All the beauty of the universe is pressing out through you into expression. All things that you desire are welling up within you pressed upward by a ceaseless and almighty urge that cannot be gainsaid. Why, dearie, there is nothing you ever dreamed of or hoped for, or longed for even in your moments of wildest imagining, that is not actually pressing, pressing, urging, to rise through you into visibility. That is not doing its best to well up and transform you and all your environment with its radiant, beautiful flow. I bath not seen nor ear heard nor bath it yet entered into the heart of you to conceive the glories that are aching to flow through you and be free. There is more beauty and art and brilliance, wit and wisdom, fine raiment and money trying, trying to come upward and outward through you, dearie, than this blessed world has yet seen. Whether you believe it or not, it is true. What is more, all these beautiful and desired things are coming through you. They are pressing out now with fast increasing impetus. It is true, dearie, it is true. Do you want to believe it? Do you want to help the universe into expression? Oh, you do. But there are so many things, and you don't know where to begin. You don't have time for these other things outside. Well, begin right where you are with the thing you are doing now. You don't have to go outside to let the beautiful things of the universe come through you. You don't have to have special times for beauty culture or health culture, or wisdom, or money growing. Did you ever see a rose tree that had special hours for growing, or a rose that needed special times for improving its complexion, or its... No more do you need special times and places for such things. All desirable things well up within you and are radiated, just as the rose's beauty is radiated. One of the greatest reasons why some people in corners of earth are not beautiful now is because they continually shut themselves up and try to get along any old way whilst they do up the so-called business of life. They promise themselves the ease and leisure to be beautiful and enjoy it away off some time in the future. Or maybe they just put it off until six o'clock when the store closes. They try to live all day on business with a promise of what little beauty and leisure they can manage to crowd in after hours. The result is that when six o'clock comes, they are literally starved, too tired to move, and must take that precious time that they meant to make beautiful for resting. That is, they must lie down and let the unseen beauties rest them. Beauty is harmony. Harmony may be seen, felt, tasted, smelt or heard. It may affect us through one or all the senses, either consciously or unconsciously. At night we sleep, and the fine harmonies of the universe play through us and bring us into tune again, all unconsciously to us, or we may listen to exquisite music, 
and so come consciously into harmony again, or we see a beautiful, quiet place and let ourselves catch the harmony there expressed. In either of these cases, or any other that we might think of, we simply quit straining, we quit promising ourselves beauty, harmony at some other time, we let go and enjoy the harmony that is now, we vibrate with the things that are and forget that tired feeling. That tired feeling comes from living on promises. You see promises point to something just out of reach and to save your life, you can't help straining out after those promised good things. Your energy flows right out in the direction of the promised good things. There are good things ahead, better things than any yet beheld. But dearie, if you keep watching them, they will ever keep ahead. Your thought fixes them in the future and keeps them moving. Just as every tomorrow is kept moving. I wish I could make you feel, as I feel, how plastic is the world and all that is therein, including time and space. It is literally true that you are what you think, and when you think it, there is really no future, only as you think it. Some people are literally almost made up of the future. They live so eternally on promises. Then there are so many poor, downhearted back number of folks who are in the same way nearly wholly composed of the past. Rarely do we meet one who is built of the present. When we do meet such a person, we see a radiant individual. The knowledge that saves is the certainty that all that is, was, or ever will be, is now. When one knows that, he lets go and vibrates with the all love life now. He is an epitome of the universal harmonies. His life is not only a song, but an exquisite blending of accompaniment beside. For him, and through him, the morning stars sing together now, heaven joys with him, and hell he has forgotten. So it is not time for these other things outside that you need, dearie, but time now to be what you have been promising yourself. What you need is to haul taut on the lifeline and get those beautiful things right down into the now. Your visible self is a statement of beliefs. Quit stating anything in the future tense. Say I am beauty, joy, everything I want. I am, I am. Stick to it until you have made yourself accept the statement. That statement alone, lived on morning, noon, and night, not to mention between times, will work in you the mightiest revolution your world has ever seen. That statement lived on will make a new creature of you will move you to new ideas and activities, will open up the way for all those unseen beauties you so ardently desire to literally come into the now. This is no frill on the garment of truth. It is truth itself. You prove truth as you do the pudding. Live on beauty, now, now, and you will prove that all beauty is now, that you are what you desire to be. You will find all you desire unfolding to your gaze, to all your senses. Remember that what you desire is not coming to you now or ever. It comes through you from the unseen into the seen world. Whilst you are in the shop waiting upon a customer, the things you desire are forming within you. You cannot see the beauty you desire, but you can feel it if you are mindful of it. If you look for it, you can feel it as a still, warm calmness at the center of you, and your customer can see it shining in your face and feel its thrill in your quiet, wholehearted attention. It will mayhap quiet the turbulent waters of her soul, and it will surely help your soul into expression of the beauties you crave. Be still, dearie, and let the unseen harmonies be seen through you. Every action that ever was made is really a vehicle for the letting of harmony from the unseen into the visible. The true art of living is only the art of letting still, be still and know the I am God within you. Be still and let what you are into this act now. Rejoice in what you are as well as in what you have. Deary, this is an accurate description of each and every step of the way from behind that counter to any place you may determine upon. Go in to win. Keep cool and sweet and be now what you desire. Chapter 6 how to be wealthy? If you are afraid to use your money, if you are close saving and skinflinty in word, thought, or deed, you are laying the foundation for unhappiness and poverty. The miser is not really rich. He is poor, poor, poor by. E, Titi, I put it there because I want to be reminded of it all the time. Metius set me to thinking lots. I don't know where to draw the line between economy and skinflinty and it gives me constant trouble to decide. 
It is awfully easy, I find, to follow out the Akami bent till it becomes closeness. At the same time, it would be very easy to give myself the ring the other way and to just let her go into extravagance. I suppose it might be said, draw the middle line, but it is very hard to know where or what is the middle line. And hence the question arises, on which side shall we err? My present opinion is that I had better err on the let her go side, as I am by nature strongly inclined to economy and self-denial. I am inclined to think that economy with me would soon lead to penuriousness and that therefore I should pursue the other tack. Besides, what do these texts mean? If not that, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, etc. And if a man ask of you a coat, give him twain something to that effect. Give him twice what he asks for. As I look at the great God of nature, he is extravagance itself. The grain of wheat is multiplied manyfold. L, the air we breathe, the water to drink, are all in riotous profusion. And everything else till man gets a hold of it and surrounds it with his little fence and says, thus far and no further. Piggot, it is not what you spend, nor what you spend it for, which makes the difference between wealth, opulence, and skinflintiness. Skinflintiness all lies in the attitude of mind which is constantly straining ahead to make a dollar buy more than a dollar's worth. The bargain counter conduces to skinflintiness, but it is a result and not a cause of it. The man who, desiring a certain thing and having the dollar to pay for it, yet hates to spend it and thinks of a dozen other things he would like to have thrown in for the dollar. Such a man is a skinflint. He is not spending like a lord. The man who, desiring a certain thing and having the dollar to pay, parts willingly with the dollar, even if it is a last one, and goes rejoicing on his way with the new purchase. This man spends as he should. He is willing to pay full price, and he enjoys his purchase. The skinflint is spoiled with visions of a dozen other things he would like to have squeezed out of that dollar. He, of course, expresses it this way. I've parted with that dollar for this thing, but there are a dozen other things I ought to have too. You see, ought is a great word with a skinflint. I used to be one and I know the vernacular. He thinks he ought to be saving and economical. When he is a confirmed skinflint, he always thinks the other fellow ought to come down on his price and he parts with his dollar only because he must in order to get that thing. Sometimes he will wear out two dollars worth of shoe leather traveling around town, trying to find that article for 99 cents. The skinflint is always nearsighted. He looks so closely at that dollar in his grasping fist that he fails to see his shoe leather and his time and energy expended in trying to crawl out of paying a full dollar as he hates to do it, no matter how many other dollars he is he hates to pay out, this one for this particular thing. All this tendeth to poverty, and it likewise generally attends poverty. Though there are well-to-do, folks who are skinflints, and on the road to penury, we are most of us skinflintian spots, especially when our income is shrinking and coal skyrocketing. I used to be skinflinty in large spots because I thought I had to in order to live at all. And the closer I got, the tighter money grew with me. At last I caught on to the knack of spending like an opulent queen what I did have to spend. And from that day things began to get better. I do not mean that all at once I went to spending recklessly for all sorts of things I happened to fancy at the moment. A glass of ice cream soda, or a new ribbon I saw in the window, a new shirt waist I thought pretty. I still denied myself all luxuries. And right here I want to tell you that it is these little wishes of the moment which are the real leakages that keep our pocketbooks flat. Not only that, but the gratifying of every momentary whim depletes your stock of desire just so much. The cutting off of these little leaks permits the tide of desire to rise higher within you for the accomplishment of things worthwhile. In the same way, it permits the rising of the money tide in your purse. Cogitate this well. I not only did not fly into all sorts of momentary indulgences, but I began to put more thought than ever into each expenditure I made. I bought nothing that was not necessary, and I always slept on it before I decided that it was necessary. Then I consulted my cash and decided what was the limit I could use for this purpose. Then I went over in my mind all the things I couldn't have if I bought this. 
I let go definitely of each one of these. I said, get thee behind me, you choose this one thing, and you may go away into forgetfulness. I do not want you. Then I went downtown and looked around until I found just the right thing to suit me. Sometimes it was on the bargain counter, sometimes among the new goods at highest price. But when I found it, I was pleased with it, and I paid gladly for it, and took it home and enjoyed it forever after. I used to be a great hand to be sorry I hadn't got something else, but I never made a purchase in this new way which I did not enjoy fully until it was worn to shreds. This was the beginning of opulence for me. After a time, I found my desires growing stronger and more definite and less numerous. And at the same time, I began to discover more money in my purse and fewer drains upon it. I know by right of discovery and experience that this is the road to wealth. And I know that what I have done in this line, every one of you can do if you will. It will take you a longer or shorter time to accomplish just in proportion as you work faithfully at it all the time or just spasmodically once in a while. It is all a matter of establishing a right habit of thought. A few thoughts once in a while will not do it, but persistent effort will. Anybody with gumption enough to learn to read can learn to think opulently. And as soon as the habit is formed, he will find that he has plenty for all his desires. More than this, spending will be a pleasure to him and the thing bought a joy forever. Chapter 7. Factors of Success Real and continued success is a mathematical result which any man or woman may obtain if he or she is willing to work carefully enough and long enough. When a man adds six and six together, he is dead sure of twelve as the result. If he makes no mistake, he is sure of the same result if he multiplies four by three or two by six. But if he gets careless and puts down any old figures he happens to think of, he fails to get 12 as a result. If he puts down 5 yuk for 12, he may fool himself for a moment or an hour. He may fool a few babies for an hour or a day, but he does not fool the teacher, who ruthlessly wipes his slate clean of both factors and result, and bids him try again. There is another thing I want you to notice about the man who does not attain his result with the right factors. The man who puts down 5x4, 12. Why did he put down 5 bays 4 instead of 3x4? He did it because he had not learned from experience that 5 doesn't go in 12 at all because he did not know the factors of 12. He had to guess at them. Consequently, he felt doubt and uncertainty all the time he was parading his little 5x4, 12 for the benefit of the innocents. He was not happy, even though some of the innocents gushed admiringly over his smartness. Inside him there was the tension and trembling of fear that after all his problem was not correct and would not stand the test of time and the teacher. He had only guessed at it instead of proving his problem until he understood just how each factor would affect the result. Of course, he would have had the same fear if he had happened to stumble on the correct factors, only by knowing the factors and their relations to each other, by actual demonstration, could he have the sweet piece of certainty as to result. I remember my first experience with the multiplication table and a teacher who must have thought it thought that she was training parrots. I had learned, of course, to add. Then suddenly, I was to learn the 2XA12 table by heart. I did, but I kept trembling inside for fear my memory would fail me and I'd state the wrong answer. Then one day it dawned on me that the whole thing was simply addition. I set down two twice, and behold, four. I set it down three times and added, and there was six just as the table gave it. I went through table after table in this way until I understood multiplication. Then it was all easy, and there was no more quivering and tension inside of me. And somehow I quit caring what the other children said about my written tables. I knew whether I was right or not, and their remarks failed to affect me either to depression or elation. Life is a still hunt for the factors of success. If we use the wrong factors, the great teacher experience wipes out our work and we have to do it all over again. This process is repeated until our wits are sharpened enough to find the right factors. Then success abides with us. But what would you think of a man who went to a healer and asked her to speak the word for 5F4 to equal 12. 
You would think him rather stupid, wouldn't you? And yet I receive just such requests as that almost daily. There are factors which simply won't go into success. Any more than five will go into 12. For instance, a man wrote me lately to treat him to hold his position and draw a higher salary. He is a man in government employ. He says a charge has been trumped up against him by a woman of no character. A false charge, but he says he has been taking advantage of the prestige given him by his government position to sell private goods, upon which he has made lots of money, and he fears this will tell against him. He says he did not neglect or injure his government work to do this, and he has been careful to attend faithfully to every detail. But of course, he naively remarks, it is really against the rules to sell goods as I have done. He wants me to influence the government to keep him and show up the falseness of the charges of the woman of no character. In other words, he wants government officials hypnotized into believing that 5ec 4 12, that he is all right when he is not. Of course, 4 will go in 12. The woman's charges may be utterly false, but there is the 5 that will not go. He has been breaking a rule and hoping to keep it quiet. The false charge only calls attention to his problem and then all the inaccuracies show up. Now if this man has learned his lesson, and this is really the only wrong factor he has been putting down, he will probably be forgiven and get another chance, with mighty sharp eyes watching for his next slip. For this is really a splendidly kind and forgiving old world, and a man who has learned a lesson and really means to get his next problem right in every detail can always find forgiveness and another opportunity. But if this man's eyes waver when he talks, if he is only trying to avoid consequences without changing that five factor any more than he is obliged, two, then the chances are he will get fired forthwith. After that, he will go about explaining to folks how he has been injured by a woman of no character and dishonestly ousted from his position by cold-blooded men who think of nobody but themselves. Instead of correcting that five, he will try adding an unlucky 13 to his little problem. He will tell folks it was the woman and the hard-hearted officials who lost him his position. When deep in his heart, he knows it was the broken rule that played hob with him. When you see people going around with a deprecatory air, telling how they have been injured and defrauded of their rights by somebody or other, you may set it right down in your little book that they are simply engaging the public's attention to keep it off their real shortcomings. Somewhere there is a figure, five where three should be, and they are making a big black, unlucky 13 to keep your eyes off the five. If you are a feeler and not a thinker, you will probably shed tears with him and maybe loan him $10 or so. As time passes and you see nothing more of your $10, you may be able to open your eyes and see that false five factor in his statement. There are a lot of things in this world that simply will not go into success. Disobedience to the letter or spirit of an employer's regulations is one of them, and every employer has a lot of mental regulations, besides the expressed ones, by which you must cheerful abide if you are to succeed with them. He is not wholly conscious of all these little mental regulations himself, so how can he put them down in black and white? But if your attentive desire is turned toward pleasing him, you will feel his desires as opportunity offers. You will please him and be successful. Of course, laziness, lack of promptitude, inattention to details, lack of order, slovenly dress, a glum or wooden expression, a slouchy, shuffling gait, a mind not on your work, an eye on the clock, a nose or tongue in other people's business, inaccuracy of statement or sticky fingers, all these are not factors which will go in success. Neither will the sort of ridicule and criticism some employees indulge in when the employer's back is turned. And it makes no difference who your employer is. You may be your own employer, but still, it remains true that none of these things will go into success. When we get down to the foundations of things, we find we are all employees of the one spirit which is running this universe. There is no use trying to fool ourselves with the idea that we have nobody to please but our own small, personal selves. In order to please ourselves, in order to realize the success we want, we have got to please the spirit that's over us all. Consecration is the first requisite of success. 
consecration to the spirit of truth as it speaks to the individual, it is not safe nor wise to do or think that which you would blush to have proclaimed from the housetops. That which is absolutely true to the spirit of truth neither shuns nor seeks exposure. When I say 3x412, there is nothing to blush for. If I say 5x412, I want either to hide it, for fear I am wrong, or else I want to parade it for the approbation of those too ignorant to detect my fallacy. Blessed is he that doubteth not in that which he allow, or doeth. When in doubt, don't do it. Wait until you are sure you will not regret. Then go ahead to victory. Be still and the spirit of truth will teach you. Do not drive ahead on some doubtful line and try to make it come out right by affirming that it will. Here is a wail from a woman. She says she went into the canvassing business expecting to succeed, and she has been treated to succeed, and she has continually affirmed that she would. But she failed. She just hates us to ring doorbells, and she despises to meet strangers, and she would never have gone into such work except for the money there was in it. Is it any wonder there was no money in it for her? Hating one's work is another factor which simply will not go into success. There must be a degree of love for the work outside the money there is in it. And this love for your business must be cherished and coaxed to grow, or your business success will not grow. Deary, when you get right down to the foundation of things, there is but one law of success, and that is the same law which governs all creation. The law of love. The man who loves every bit of his work will coin his very highest soul into it. He will make it such a beautiful and glorified thing that the world will run to see. Oh and will pay for his work almost any price he can ask. Success is certainly to him who keeps in line with his own ideals and aptitudes. Chapter 8. To be square. If you had a fine horse upon whose swiftness your fortunes depended, how would you treat it? Would you house it carelessly and make a pack horse of it between races? Would you stuff it on all sorts of foods, keep it standing for weeks in the stable, and then expect it to win the race for you? Would you keep it chasing over the country all night and then expect it to win next day? Of course you would not, but you treat yourself that way. And then go around clad in rags and a grieved expression because you have failed in the races for success. In the races of life, there are classes enough for all. Every man, woman, and child may win his races and carry off his prizes. If he takes proper care of himself and observes carefully the rules of the race, with proper preparation and a good understanding, any man can win his races. By proper preparation, I do not mean a college education, nor do I mean even that a man's youth must be spent in any sort of school. There is Owen Kilder, for instance, whose story appears in February success. He is now winning his races and wearing his laurels. Although his early life was spent as newsboy, prizefighter, and a lound tough, and he never learned to read until he was 30 years old. Now, at 38, he is a successful story writer and a real helper in the world's work. It is never too late to catch on to the principle of success. That is literally what one has to do in order to win the races. Owen Kilder was a success even in the slums, and all his life was a schooling. He was square. He lived up to his best understanding, and his understanding grew. Every man is born into just the school he needs to prepare him for success in life. If he is not square with himself in the class he is born into, he stays perhaps a lifetime in that class. Perhaps he drops down, down, down to the foot of the class, all because he is not square in his treatment of the lessons life presents to him. He shirks. What does it mean to be square? It means a different thing to every man on earth, and yet it means always one thing to do what your own spirit says is right, and to keep your word actual or implied. To be square requires a steady purpose, in other words, self-control. To be square one must control it feelings instead of letting them run away with him. The boy who plays hooky when he feels like it is not square with himself nor the world, there is an ought in his heart which he is not square with. Life is full of mournful fizzles who habitually play hooky when they feel like it. They feel like alighting this thing and that, and no, they play hooky.
They feel like lying ab late in the morning, though that little odd inside, and may happen employer outside, admonishes them to get up even if they don't happen to feel like it. Something is expected of them, and they shirk. Tacitly, their word is given to be on time, and they are not on time. They are not square. The little odd inside is the well-laid track upon which the individual's life may safely run. When he jumps that track and runs on feeling alone, he is not square with the world, and there is danger ahead, and he plows along in the wrong direction, injuring himself and others. He follows feeling and lies abed. He is late at his work and dumpy when he gets there. His employer feels that he is not fairly treated. If he acts upon his feeling the sleepy head will get his salary reduced, then he will tell folks what a stingy old curmudgeon his employer is, for he will never see that his own lack of square dealing has anything to do with his lack of funds or success. If there is anything the feeling follower is really proficient in anything where he shows himself a glorious genius, it is in finding excuses for himself and to himself. He never flies the smooth track of aught unless there was a great big bogeyman to throw him off. But his bogeyman somehow will never stand the camera test. They are big and valid excuses only in his own mind. The feeling follower has an artistic imagination. He is ingenious. If only he would exercise his ingenuity in keeping on the track, he'd get his salary raised. Of course, the sense of oughtness is conscience, and conscience is a matter of education. The Hindu mother thinks she ought to drown her baby girls in the Ganges. Owen Kildare used to think he ought to be a slugger. He religiously knocked down every fellow who failed to toe the scratch in slumdom. Roosevelt, E.D.A., thinks he ought to knock down Spain for being mean to Cuba and the Filipinos. Tolstoy thinks he ought to resist nothing. All these people are winners in their own particular races because they square their acts with their oughts. And no two of them has just the same kind of ought. Each has the conscience he is educated up to. Conscience is a matter of education, but it has to be minded just the same. The Hindu must mind her conscience and she will win her races. Tolstoy must mind his conscience if he would win his. You must mind your conscience if you would win. And you must mind your conscience as it is, not as you'd like to have it be. If your conscience tells you to hop out of bed, now it will not do to lie still and philosophize about it and explain away the ought and conjure up an excuse for flying its track. You can silence the ought, but you can't convince it. You can no more explain it away than you can explain away the shining steel rails between here and New York. You can ignore either and get hurt. But they are there until you can educate your conscience up to the point of letting you do what you want to do. You would better do what it bids you even if you don't happen to feel like it. The true preparation for success in life is to be had anywhere, in school or slum, in war or peace. All life's experiences are simply opportunities for you to set the habit of being square with the God in you and the gods without. This is character. Did you ever watch a horse race? Perhaps there are half a dozen entries, every one of which has been fed, exercised and groomed to the highest state of perfection, each according to the best judgment of its own particular groom. Now they appear ready for the running. When the signal is given to start, the horses are all wheeled around with the aim to keep them abreast as they pass under the wire ready for the signal. Go. But there are always some jockeys who are not square. They are so eager to get ahead of all the others that they swing too far ahead, and the whole lot have to be started over again. Time and again, this false start is repeated, all because some of the jockeys are not trying to get a fair start. They are trying to get the start of the others. They want to take all the advantage they can get. They are not square. And did you ever see one of these unfair jockeys win the race? I never did. The jockey who cannot control his feelings and starts square gets rattled and urges his horse so excitedly that the horse breaks and goes to pieces. Then when the jockey knows he has lost the race, he takes it out on the poor horse, which finally comes in all panting and foam covered at the tail of the race. And the same horse with a self-contained jockey would have won the race. The self-contained jockey rules his feelings and keeps to the track of ought 
which is the track of wisdom and success. It is easy for a man to do as he ought in little things, and if he takes pains to do it in little things, he will find he has grown power to do as he ought when big things turn up. It is this doing as he ought, as his own soul says he ought, which enables a man to learn the lessons set for him in his particular class in life. And it is the learning of the lessons in one class which fits him for those of a higher class. This is why the shirk, who isn't square, has a hard row to hoe and never gets promoted. The ought in a man is the voice of the principle of his being. Success is the result of obedience to this voice. Your feelings are the racehorse upon whose swiftness and right handling depend on the races of your life. You are not your feelings. You are the intelligence and will which govern and inform your feelings. You are the groom who cares for and the jockey who directs the racehorse of feeling. Will you direct feeling or will you let feeling run away with you? Remember, feeling is your racehorse. How will you treat it? Will you train it for the great events of life? Will you let it run loose without a purpose? Will you make a pack meal of it to carry petty and unnecessary burdens for Tom, Dick, and Harry? A good horse trainer takes great care of the feelings of his horse. He never jerks the reins and yells at him. He never lets him stand uncurried and unfed in a dirty stable with little yapping, snapping curs to torment him. He never loads him with unnecessary burdens and flogs him up hill and down. But that is what men do with themselves. A man neglects his own brain and body and soul. He curses himself and his luck. He permits himself to be loaded with unnecessary annoyances. And then he jaws around about never being able to do as he wants to and wonders what life is good for anyway. A good horse trainer never pampers his horse either. He does not give him free access to the oat bin. Neither does he curry him daily to the last pitch of shininess, blanket him and keep him always under a roof. A man stuffs himself at all hours, upon any sort of food which tempts his palate. He overdresses and underexercises himself, and cusses the world in general because his feelings are unruly. A good horse trainer does not stuff his horse for supper and chase him around over the country until two o'clock in the morning as a preparation for next day's race. No, it takes a man or woman to do such things as that with himself and then expect success. If you want to be a real success in life, you must have one purpose to which all other purposes are tributary. You must have one aim and all the actions of your life must be so governed as to assist in the one direction. This does not mean that a whole lifetime must be devoted to a single pursuit, nor that you must have no other pursuits whilst you are following the one. But it does mean that no other pursuits shall come before the one that you shall have no other gods before that. If you neglect business for art or art for business, both will fail. If you pursue art as a recreation, to better prepare you for business, if you pursue art when business does not call you, if at the slightest call of business you fly instantly with your whole soul to that, you will make a success of business and the art will help you to do it. But if business is the present aim, everything else must be dropped instantly and willingly at its lightest call. Only so will business be a success. This is concentration. A racehorse is not always racing. Neither is the most successful man in any line, always thinking and working on that line. But he is always thinking and working on tributaries of his special line. Clara Morris and Bernhard find recreation in art, history, literature, outdoor life. Things not necessarily connected at all with their stage life, but all of which tend to breadth and depth of character and a splendid health and thus add to the power of their work on the stage. But Paderewski or Gabrilowicz or Hoffman would not turn to heavy manual labor for recreation, lest it stiffen their supple fingers. Neither would any of these successful artists indulge in midnight carousals and unseasonable but highly seasoned feasts. With them, all things which will not assist them in their main purpose are ruthlessly cut out entirely. It is this self-command and one-purposeness which enables them to win their races. The lack of these is the one cause of all failures. I find, upon looking however this article, that, as a whole, it is quite a mixed metaphor, 
but never mind it is like life itself, which is decidedly a mixed metaphor, and none the less interesting for the mixture. Chapter 9. One Thing at a Time When I receive a letter which says the writer has so many desires, it is impossible to enumerate them. My heart shows a tendency to slip into my shoes. Such a one is really a hard case. Desire is the creator, but when desire is spread over a host of things, it is no longer desire. It is mere shallow wishing and accomplishes little. You can no more spread out your wishes and works over a multitude of things and bring success than you can clean a dozen rooms all at once. One thing at a time, be definite. What do you want? Call them all up in a row for inspection. What will you have first? Decide upon one thing and then banish the other wishes until this one is realized. Make your mental demand for this one thing. Be still and let the spirit tell you what to do and how. Keep affirming it. Be faithful to this one thing until you realize it. When it is well in sight, call up your wishes again and make another selection. Then banish all others and wish hard and affirm harder and work faithfully for that one. One thing at a time and that well done is the road to all accomplishment and each thing well done increases your capacity. One thing properly demonstrated over makes way for better and quicker demonstration over the next thing. When you are learning to do things, it is wise to begin on the easy ones. So in choosing which of your desires shall engage all your attention, now it is usually best to choose not the hardest and biggest one, but the one nearest at hand and most reasonable and easy. Generally, this is the quickest road to realizing the desire as well as the lesser ones. Now ready, dearie, look the desires over judicially. Decide, choose. Now go in to win and keep at it with quiet confidence. Success is yours. I told you to get down to one desire at a time and to work and treat for that alone. But sometimes it is hard to decide upon anyone as the most important. Sift as you may, there will still seem to be several things equally urgent. Now, dearie, you can work daily for several things provided you go rightly about it. When you go to school, you work for success in geography, grammar, and arithmetic, and you succeed in all. Not only that, but you do better in each than you would probably do if you had one study alone. There is a lot in getting your hand in and keeping it in. When one puts in so many hours every day, say four, in study, it soon becomes habit and you do it readily and easily. When perhaps one hour a day would scarcely enable you to get well interested before the hour would be over. But if you put the whole of four hours in on one study, your mind would tire of the steady strain in one direction. Whereas if you divided the time among three studies, your interest would be refreshed and your mind quickened by each change. But what result would you expect if you sat down with all three textbooks before you to put in four hours work at one stretch, dipping a moment into one book, then skipping to the others and back again innumerable times? How much interest could you take in such exercise of the mind? How much could you really take in? How many problems could you work out if you tried to carry the bounding of the Red Sea and the parsing of a sentence at the same time you worked at the problem? You would fail in every study for lack of concentration. But that is what we are all prone to do with our life problems. We jumble them up together and fizzle. Whilst we are doing our kitchen problem, our minds are trying to practice on the piano or make money or grow spiritual or treat ourselves out of conditions or do all at once. Our thoughts fly hit and miss from one thing to another with, oh, I wish this and I wish that. And all the time our kitchen problem is slighted and we are accomplishing next to nothing, if not quite nothing, with the other things. Now, if you have simmered your desires down to their last essence, and there are still several, instead of one, just divide your time as wisely as possible between them. The better success you make on anyone, the greater will be your capacity for success in the others. Suppose you have a kitchen problem you can't just now get rid of, and you want musical opportunities. Oh, so much, and you must have health. And now there are three things you want, opportunities to practice, health and money and there's that kitchen problem you must solve and the last shall be first give the kitchen problem all the time and thought it needs to slight that is to reduce the power for the others 
Set your time for that. Now set another time for practice, another for health exercise and concentration, and another for concentration for money. Take health, we'll say, first thing in the morning. Rise half an hour early, if need be, and make it from 6.30 to 7.0, perhaps, or earlier. Begin with breathing exercises and light gymnastics enough to wake up on. Follow with a cool shower or sponge bath and rub down if possible. Then sit down or lie down for 20 minutes or more and concentrate on health and nothing else. Keep bringing your mind right down to the word whole. I am whole. Get interested in imagining how whole and strong and lovely you are. Imagine yourself as you want to be. Now it will be time to change classes and take up your kitchen problem. So put your whole mind and body into that. Keep calling in your thought and interest and putting it into your work. After a few days of this, you will find your kitchen problem solving beautifully. You will see new things to omit and new ways of doing things, and you will find your kitchen problem becoming a real pleasure and taking much less time. At another time, take your hour or half hour for money. Sit straight and alert, take slow, full breaths, and picture money pouring into your purse. Get enthused over the picture and keep telling yourself it is real and the money is yours. But never permit yourself to wonder how the money is to come or through who. Simply picture it as coming to you from the all-encircling good. Feel just as tickled over it as you can. When this half-hour money study is over, dismiss it entirely from your mind and keep dismissing it every time it happens to come in again. When your practice hour has arrived, put your whole mind and soul and imagination and affirmation into that. See yourself a Paderewski preparing for a unique career and pour your soul into sounds for the joy of the whole world. Practice exactly the time you have allotted yourself and use the same time every day. Follow the same rule with all these other problems. Be prompt to the second. But if something unforeseen does happen to prevent, remember that the most important thing is to keep sweet mentally and take the first minute you can for your exercises. All sorts of ups up, feelings put your mind out of tune so that you must use more time tuning up again before your mental exercises are at their best. If you do one thing at a time, as if that were the only thing you'd ever have to do with all eternity to do it in, you can work for several things at once. Remember your school days and use the same principle these days. Life is made up of school days and success is yours. Last but not least, remember to take plenty of recesses from your work and concentration and practices. If you filled your lungs full of air and then kept them full, it would be only a matter of a little while until you die. It is by expanding and then relaxing, expanding and relaxing, that we keep the breath of life going. To try to keep the lungs full all the time would be death. The same law comes into all we do. To work steadily without playing and resting between times would have the same effect as holding your breath. To work with all your mind and soul and body and then to let go with all your mind and soul and body is to complete a real breath of life. All work and no play or all play and no work makes us stupid and weak. But plenty of whole-souled work alternated with plenty of whole-souled rest makes us strong and wise and keeps us growing. So take plenty of little recesses, dearie, every day. Go out and take a sun bath and a soul bath and take slow, full, even breaths of the all-pervading love and wisdom and will of the universe. Let life live you. Fluff yourself all out loose and let the world forces and the unseen forces play through you a while. Then you will feel like being strenuous again when the time comes. Chapter 10. Joy Words all my life, I have been searching for happiness in many different ways, but have never found the real thing. You have been hunting happiness outside of you. You have expected happiness to flow from things into you. You have expected happiness as a result of making your environment fit you. All your efforts have been put forth in this direction, and you have constantly met with disappointment and unhappiness, as everybody will whose happiness is pinned to his conditions. Conditions, like people, are growing things. Never two minutes in exactly the same state. If you pin your happiness to a thing or a friend, you will probably have to unpin it before night. 
Happiness, real happiness of the abiding, growing kind, never comes as a result of fitting circumstances to your notions. It comes from fitting yourself to circumstances. In no other way can it be found. After all this is much easier to do, there is but one of you to be adjusted, while all the rest of creation goes to make up your environment, and your power over yourself is practically unlimited, whilst your power over even your immediate environment is next to nothing. What power has a convict over his prison walls and keepers? But he has all power over his mind, and he has all power over his body within the limits set by his prison walls and his keeper's rules. A convict can be a fool and fret away his life within those walls. He can sulk mentally and refuse to use his physical powers as far as permitted. If he does this, he falls sick and dies, an unhappy man. Unhappy because he fretted over what he couldn't do instead of doing what he could. Or the prisoner may use as he pleases that part of himself which cannot be walled in by any number of bolts and bars. He may think as high and as bravely and well as he chooses, and he may use his physical energies as bravely and well as he may. He may make the best of his opportunity to learn a trade and to cheer and help others, as he may, even in a prison. If he does this, he will be in those grim environs a happier man than are three quarters of the men who are outside prison walls. Not only this, but he will win from his keeper's kindness and consideration not accorded the indifferent or defiant prisoner, and he will shorten his term of sentence. Still further than that, he will come forth from that prison a stronger, wiser, happier man than he has ever been before, e. a man better equipped for success for having been in that prison, a happier and more successful man than he would have been without that bit of education. There are two of the world's greatest railroad magnates who are examples of this very thing, one of whom is making over London today. Now, every human being is in a prison of circumstances. He is there because he deserves to be. He has attracted it to himself. It is the particular sort of prison he needs just now. It is stocked with just the sort of things he needs to exercise mind, will, and muscles upon, to fit him for the next higher class in the line of his desires. Will he adjust himself to it all and work happily, faithfully, willingly, and thus shorten his sentence? Or will he kick the walls and curse his work? made and lengthen his sentence? Will he accept things and work happily, or will he grumble and kick and be unhappy? It all depends upon himself. His environment is his friend if he works with it, his foe if he turns against it. One is happy with his friends, no matter in what garb they come. One is unhappy with those he is turned against, no matter how richly they are dressed or how fair they may appear. Do you really want to be happy? Do you want happiness enough to pay the price for it? Happiness is a jealous God. He simply will not live in the same heart with fault-finding, growls, dislikes. Do you want happiness badly enough to make you turn out all these things no matter what happens? Then happiness will come into you and grow up in you until it fills every crack and cranny of your being and makes you feel so good that you will entirely forget to growl and find fault and dislike things. Happiness and goodwill are Siamese twins. You simply must have them both, or live without either. Growls and dislikes always send goodwill into the dark closet, and then happiness flies away. You must choose goodwill and keep on choosing until it fills you and radiates such positive energy that growls and dislikes simply shrivel and cannot get into your mind or heart at all. That reminds me, of Kipling's just-so stories, but it isn't so imaginary as you might suppose. There are growls and dislikes flying through the air, seeking dark auras where they may abide. You have a solar center which is intended to do for your body and atmosphere what the sun does for its solar system. It is meant to radiate goodwill or love to fill you with light and real soul warmth of the sort that is instant death to growls and dislikes as light brings instant death to shadows. But there is one little spot where a growl or grumble can always get in and turn off the soul radiance and make your face and body and atmosphere all dark, so that all the other growls and dislikes will come in too, 
and hold high jinks where they ought not to be. Achilles had just one little spot on his heel. The feet represent the understanding. You know where the enemy could hurt him. You have just one little spot where a growl can enter and shut off all your radiance of light and happiness. The little spot of choice. If you choose to grumble as it presents its frowsy, bristly head, it hops over the sill and comes in. And the very first thing it does is to touch the button and shut off your goodwill radiations. Next, it throws open the doors and windows of your mind and invites in all its relations. It's to keep out growls, just paste up a big notice. No growls admitted. Not even on business. If a growl is impudent enough to come in when you are not looking, just throw him downstairs. And all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put him together again. Now, growls are quite as intelligent as other folks if they get an unvarying and decidedly warm brogan. They give it up and go hunt for somebody who is in the habit of letting them in. All you have to do is to cultivate the habit of firing them. Then your solar center will shine brighter and brighter, and goodwill and happiness will hold open house to every little thought body that's nice. And your sentence will be commuted, and you will go into a bigger, better place. And happiness will keep right on growing. Smile. Smile alike upon just or unjust. Get interested in seeing how happy you can be. Take a few minutes the first thing every morning to cultivate real happiness, which is joy. Sit down with a pencil and paper in a good, comfortable, straight back chair. Place the paper on the table and hold the pencil ready for business. Now say to yourself, joy. And as you say it, make a firm, bold dot with your pencil. Repeat. Make the next dot firmly right over the first one. Right in it, I mean. Simply make the one mark blacker and firm. And mentally put that single word joy right into that firm pencil dot. Put the real joy into it. See how perfectly one you can make the pencil mark and the mental word. Bring joy down to a fine point. Do this 25 or 30 times at a sitting, saying joy very positively with each dot of the pencil. Do it all very deliberately, calmly, positively, resolutely. Then go quietly about your work. You will be surprised to see how smoothly and pleasantly your work goes. Whenever things seem to get into a snarl, or you feel discouraged or burdened, drop everything like a hot potato. Go into another room and use this little joy exercise a few minutes. It's magic. Just do it and see. And you will be surprised to see how little time it takes. And you will be amazed at how much time it saves. Time saved from wrangles and jangles to be used in joy. This is what the Bible means when it says, Break off thy sins by tightness. Break off jangles with joy brought down to a fine point. Chapter 11. Success Letters. One attention, please. Attention is to you what the lens is to a camera. It focuses power for you. Keep your attention upon success, upon opulence, until success is imprinted upon every brain cell. I am success. When you take your Kodak for an outing, you only turn it upon what you want to preserve, but you deliberately focus your attention upon what you don't want preserved. What nonsense. Turn to success to all you desire as the needle to the pole. Refuse to see the opposite. Deny it. Smash the negatives. Keep on filling yourself with I am success pictures. Keep cool. Keep aiming. The word is with you daily, and success is sure as sunrise to every one of you who pays attention to what you want instead of to what you don't want. Think success. Act success. Feel success. To now look pleasant. How do you expect to attract customers, friends, or money to a vinegar visage or a doleful wail? Nature abhors glumness, and it escheweth the glum. And every live thing flees at sight of the smileless and loiters, not until he is out of earshot of the complainer. Don't imagine you may be an exception to the rule. You are not. Birds of a feather cleave together. If you want pleasant people and things and plenty of gold and greenbacks, you must make yourself akin to them. Nice people and gold and greenbacks look pleasant. Go thou and do likewise. Never mind how you feel inside. Look pleasant. Smile. A smile not only attracts all the good things in the universe, but it is the most powerful of auto-suggestions for what you desire. A smile not only shines outward from your face, warming up and attracting friends and money, 
but it also shines inward, reaching at last the solar center, the sun of you. The smile born on the surface of you will vibrate inward. The solar sun will catch its rhythm and smile back. And the smile of the solar sun is to you what the smile of old soul is to the earth, life and joy. The shine of our solar center is what grows success. So look pleasant, please, whilst I speak the word for you. Look pleasant, act pleasant, and you are pleasant. Keep cool, keep sweet, keep aiming. Success is growing. Three, how do you think, sweetheart? How do you do? How do you feel is of no consequence, so I'll not ask it. Stop your efforts now for a few minutes and get your bearings again. What are you aiming for? Success in business, which is simply the result of self-expression. Self-expression has a money value, and he who most freely expresses presses out himself, his thought, into the visible, practical world receives most money from the world. You have within you unlimited force which only needs expression to bring you unlimited, visible wealth. How to get it out has been the question. I say unto you that the way to get it out is to put it into each thing you find to do. Wake up and see how much thought you can put into the one thing in hand. The more thought force you put into what you do, the more self you have expressed, pressed out of yourself. See? And the more money you will bring. And one thing done that way is always a stepping stone to something better, and each brings you nearer to the goal of your desire. That goal is fixed and every experience takes you nearer, but every half-done thing is a loitering, by the way. Not because the thing must be done, there's a matter of choice, but because you have lost the opportunity to press out yourself, and there is really a fixed quantity of self that must be expressed before you can attract money in great measure. It is the expressed self which is the magnet. Now let's see where we are at. We desire success. Success is our objective point. Real money, real success. We are getting there by putting ourselves into each thing that turns up, by getting interested in it and doing it with a will. Now there is one thing right here to be guarded. When we are putting ourselves into anything, we must be quiet and take pains not to spill ourselves and thus waste energy. We are to be quietly confident so that we put into each thing just the right amount of self, of thought energy, and not let it slop over. I see you are catching on. Now we are ready for a new month and the best one yet. The word is with you. Steady now. Keep cool. Keep sweet. Keep at it. Success is ours. Four, let go. Be still. And concentrate your efforts. One day at a time is all you can live. Live it and let the law work out the future. The word is with you and all you desire is manifesting. No matter how you feel, it is manifesting. Keep cool, keep sweet, keep at it. Success is sure. Five, I am so glad to have you say you would rather heal poverty than any other disease because it is the trunk of which 99 other diseases are only branches. That appealed to me more than any I've read yet. I work from eight in the morning until six and after, striving to succeed. And sometimes it is very discouraging. If I could only put aside the annoying things that worry the life out of one, tell me how to stop it or throw it off, please. Quit fighting your best friends and you will more quickly realize the success you desire. Your best friends are the little things, the little things that annoy you now. Wake up and see that these little things bring only good to you each one of them is a little opportunity. Think of the opportunities you have wasted by impatience, not to mention the time wasted afterward in fretting over what occurred. Think of the thought force wasted over all these little happenings. Yes, think about it and turn over a new leaf. Every one of these little things is a golden opportunity to practice concentration. Put your mind to seeing how beautifully you can meet each little emergency and make the best of it. Take pride in seeing how cheerfully you can accept the consequences that seem to be against you. You will find out later that it was the best thing that could have happened. Soon you will cease to have such annoyances because you will have loved them into pleasures. 6 June was a great deal, the best month we have had since going into business here. But since then, business has been dull in Mr. A., Hasn't the faith in it that he once had? Does his lack of faith have any effect on your treatments of him? 
I don't care how much or how little faith he has or if he has none at all. There are ebbs and floods in the pocketbook of every human being who isn't a hired man. Any millionaire will tell you his floods were always succeeded by ebbs. But each new flood rose higher. When the tide receded, he hatched up new schemes to take advantage of the next rise. Faith or no faith, if you will keep cool, keep sweet, keep your wits awake and get ready for the rise, it will come. 7. Ret not thy heart because of evildoers. Things are not always what they seem. Remember thy Creator, thy Thinker. Think what thou desire, affirm it. Stamp thy stout foot and affirm it again. Keep cool as a cucumber. Keep sweet as a wild rose. Keep steady as old soul. Keep at it. You are succeeding. The word is with you and success grows. Just aim, sweetheart, and grumble never, inside or out. 8. Concentrate. Concentrate, concentrate, and got things down to a fine point. Keep cool, keep sweet, keep aiming. Let your sun center shine alike on just and unjust. Both are elements of success. Steady, sweetheart, nine now straighten up, dearie, and stand at attention. Close your eyes and look upward. Now feel all through you, the invisible one power that is too fine and mighty to feel with eyes open. Take into your being this subtle power in a full, slow, even breath. Hold your chest expanded whilst that power renews and fills you. Then gently, lovingly, steadily breathe it out upon the object you are aiming for. Take three drafts of power of God before you stop and do it whenever you think of it. Then turn your whole attention to the next thing there is to do and see how much ingenuity and loving thought you can put into the doing. The word is in every breath you thus take, and all you desire is growing. Ten, you have been applying yourself closely to business. You have been breathing out more than you breathed in. So you have nearly drained yourself of vital force. That is what makes you see things through gray spectacles, if not blue. That is why you feel like saying, what's the use? Whenever you feel thus, you may know right away that you are expending more force than you are taking in. There is no need of this. The supply of vital energy is really and truly unlimited for every one of you. All you have to do is to inhale it with lungs and brain. You can take in all the force you need for anything you want to do, but you can no more take in enough force in the morning to keep you running all day without that tired feeling than you can take in breath enough to run you a day or a week. Your brains are a pair of lungs that you have to use. You have to take in statements of power and then turn the power upon your work. And you have to do it many, many times a day until you learn to be literally conscious of your power all the time. Whenever you get to seeing gray or blue, just let go. Straighten up and use both pairs of your lungs. Face the sun with eyes turned upward and take three of the deepest, slowest, fullest drafts of power that you can manage. Think power, 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 and think it emphatically and slowly. It is not necessary to face the visible sun always, but face the I am sun in you, and cast your eyes upward, because all power comes from above. See, now you feel like a new being and are ready to give out your power again, ready to put I am into I do. In addition to this, if it is possible, change your kind of work for a time. When one keeps right at one thing, he is very apt to keep on breathing out. His force gets to running out, and it just keeps on running that way from habit. It takes thought to make any change. And with us high-strung people, it takes a lot of very deliberate thought to get our nerves to keep open to receive as much vital energy as we give out. We keep on giving out until our nerves collapse, just as a rubber tube will from which all the water is sucked out. This is literally true. We start in to put our energy into some piece of work and the attraction of that work just sucks us dry and collapses our nerves. It takes thought to keep ourselves from being ruled by our work and ruined too. But we can keep from it. Oh yes, there is just nothing we can't do when once we see the point and go in to win. And we not only can rule these things, but we glory in doing it. We glory in our power and in showing it. When once we get the notion of using our power on ourselves, we are on the high road to greater achievements than the world has ever before dreamed of. And we are on that road now, and we are making rapid progress. 
We rejoice in our growth and our appetite is whetted for more self-command and more growth. Oh, we are the people and we are inheriting the earth and the sun too. Glory to the I am in us. 11. Your realization of success is growing. Oh, yes, it is. You have ups and downs and when you look down, you feel down and it seems to you that success is not growing. All because you look down instead of up. Do you know that if you had $1 million a year, like Mr. Schwab of the Steel Trust, if you kept looking at it and comparing it with what you might have had or what somebody else has, you'd feel as poor and unsuccessful as you possibly could under these conditions. And if you owned the earth, you'd compare it with Jupiter and grumble because you couldn't annex that. You see that is because you let yourself drop back into the old-fashioned habit of thinking success consists in things. Success consists in ability to enjoy yourself in the process of evolving things. Mr. Schwab enjoys his ability to create things, and the one million dollars is simply the result, the proof of his success. The joy of doing is the real success. Plenty of money flocks to the joyful doer who believes that justice rules, that his own comes to him. Mr. Schwab says he used to work over hours and out of shop, anywhere he saw something to be done, whether there was to be extra pay or not. But he says that all the time he knew that somehow, somewhere, from somebody he would draw good pay for every minute's work put in. Now, dearie, that is the secret of success in less than a nutshell. Put in your best licks with joy now and glory in what is coming. Set your stake as high as you dare and know that it is yours. But remember this, Mr. Schwab was success from the first. He enjoyed every bit of the work it took to fit him for his present position. And it is not the one million dollars which is now his success, but his joy in doing and in knowing that all he does will be well paid for. Success is within and wells outward into acts. Remember, remember, and keep remembering. Act as if it is true. Keep sweet and keep cheerily working out your ideals. I am with you for success now. You are all you desire to be work it out. 12. Success is the natural result of intelligent effort. Failure is the natural result of unintelligent effort. The degree of success in any man's life is determined by the exact amount of intelligence he puts into his efforts. Take a careful inventory of today's efforts, dearie. How much of it is done perfunctorily, grumblingly, from habit or compulsion? And not because you have waked up, surveyed conditions and ideals, and decided that under these circumstances, and just now, this is the highest, best thing you can do. Unless you have thus decided, this particular effort you are engaged in is not an intelligent effort and therefore is not adding to your success. It is a thoughtless effort, a drudgery, and is wasting your energy and your success. Now quit short if you cannot put intelligence, will, interest into this effort and make it serve a purpose. Then stop short and sit or lie perfectly relaxed until you can make your efforts tell. Far better do nothing at all than to waste energy in such wasteful effort. At least be still and let energy accumulate. After a bit, you will find yourself again able to put intelligence into your motions. When you do not know just what to do and how to do it, be still. Be still all over. See how still you can be. Intelligence and power will well up inside and fill you again to overflowing. Then you will know what to do and how. And it, in the meantime, whether you are putting intelligence into effort or into being still, success grows. I am with you. 13. Wake up now. Drop the burden of feelings, symptoms, and responsibilities and get interested heart and soul in the thing you decide is the work of now. The best thing to do under existing conditions. Do it as a child does things with no thought beyond or before either. See how much fun and freedom you can put into it, then do the next thing you want to do and do it with a will. Put your imagination into your work and play at it. Ditto when you rest. Relax your body definitely and all over and rise into the realm of imagination. See what wild and happy flights you can take. Picture yourself as you desire to be. Stretch your imagination in this direction. Then affirm all those happy things for yourself in the present tense. Say, I am all those things.
and by thunder, I'll prove it. Then go in to win some more, to prove some more, to work out some more of the delightful things that are within you. Don't you know your imagination is within you and whatever you see in imagination is within you? And anything that is within you can be worked out. And I'll whisper something else to you, dearie. Imagination is the only source of power or not power. An imagination filled with desirable things is inspiration, the real thing that enables you to do anything. And an imagination filled with undesirable things is a paralyzer. Think about it now and see if it is not so. An imagination is the one place where you can do anything. Jan can imagine good things or bad things at will. So be sensible, dearie, and imagine good things and then work them out. It is fun to work out good things. If you find working is not fun, just stop short and see how far you can stretch your imagination again in desirable directions. That's where the power comes from. Go off and into your powerhouse. 14. Be still and know. Be still and know. Bow that you are what you will to be. Be still and will success. Be still, relax. Let go definitely of everything you don't want. Wave your hand and banish each one. Then let go each thing you do want. Let go. You were tired and strained from hanging on. You were so strained that the life force could not flow through and fill you and forward your work. Now you are resting, all limp and loose, and life is pouring through your body and recharging it with the magnetism that attracts to you what you desire. Now you are rested and filled with quiet, good feeling and will. Rise now and see how well you can use your fresh energy. Success is yours and I am with you. Fifteen good. Brace up again and go in to win. You are succeeding. Better than you realize yet. My word is with you constantly. Walk straight up to the mark of your desires and you will find every lion is but a lamb. Keep at it. You will gain confidence with every attempt and win beyond your expectations. I am with you and success is yours. All things work together to bring about what you desire. Chapter 12. Desire for this, that, and the other you will never reach the place where you have all you want to spend except by commanding yourself to spend and to want to spend less than your income, whatever that may happen to be. For having all you want to spend is a state of mind, not a matter of hundreds, thousands, or millions of dollars income. With all Anna Goods millions her French husband, de Castellane, has never had all he wanted to spend. You will never have enough for your needs except by ruling your needs. For this too is a state of mind, not a matter of the size of your income. You need what you think you need. And in order to have enough for your needs, you must change your mind as to your needs. This is the only sure way to do it. To enlarge your income will never do it because your needs will grow with your income. As long as your state of mind remains unchanged, always outstripping your income. Your needs will continue to suck the life out of your income and howl for more. Try it if you will, but you will only prove that what I tell you about is true and I know from a full experience. To seek to increase your income to cover your needs is to follow a will-o'-the-wisp which will lead you into quagmires of dissatisfaction, if not debt. That way lies defeat. Every human being is a little garden patch of desires where one desire or set of desires must thrive at the expense of another desire or set of desires. Just as your strawberry plants must thrive at the expense of the weeds which try so hard to grow along with your berry plants. As you nip those weeds in the bud in order to give the strawberry plants a chance to grow and bear fruit, so in the garden of your heart you must continually nip in the bud the undesirable desires in order to allow the desirable desires to gain in stature and bear fruit. All our beautiful flowers had their beginnings in weeds. The gardener gave a tiny young weed its particular place in his garden. He gave it rich earth and plenty of moisture. He sheltered it from cold winds and allowed no other weeds, nor even his choicest plants, to grow near to it and sap its energy, and he clipped innumerable little sprouts and buds from that weed and from the earth near it as fast as they appeared leaving only one bud to mature and just leaves enough to give that one bud plenty of breathing capacity. So in time there were roots enough for a great sprawling weed with scores of little gnarly shoots and flowers. 
but there was only one slender stalk with a single bloom. And such a bloom, no weed had ever before borne such a flower. Then the seeds of that one flower were planted, and the tiny plants tended as the first one had been. And behold, a still larger and more beautiful flower, then after many generations of this careful tending and clipping process, a plant was allowed to bear several blooms, all of which were so large and beautiful that you'd never dream their great-grandmother was that gnarly little weed that tried to elbow everything else out of the garden. The desire to live within your income is a homely and necessary plant which should be cultivated at all hazards. Where this desire is not thrifty and strong, you will find it surrounded by weeds which are trying to grow at its expense. Weeds of desire for this, that and the other, all good things in themselves, but not good in their effects, unless procured without straining your income, which, if allowed foothold, will eventually mature and bring forth the gnarled flowers and bitter fruits of theft, embezzlement, and even such men as the world and their old friends have learned to execrate as betrayers of public and private trust, such men as Butler and Blair of St. Louis and Holly of Hollyoak and innumerable, defaulting cashiers, etc. Are men who have permitted the weeds of desire for this, that and the other, to completely choke out the desire to keep within their income? We know their fate and abhor it, even if we are charitable enough not to abhor them. But many of us are on the same tack without realizing it. The man or woman who has it charged is growing a weed of desire for this, that and the other, at the expense of the desire to keep within income. They are crowding out the homely plant of honesty by letting the weeds choke it. If they keep at it long enough and have courage enough and opportunity enough, they will be Blairs or Hollies. The weeds of desire for this, that and the other will possess them. But the common run of us are too cowardly and our opportunities too limited, probably because we are cowardly to enable us to shine so conspicuously as getters of this, that, and the other for which we cannot pay. We don't go too far. Fear of punishment, either by the public authorities or an angry God, or by the hell fires inside of us, deters us from outright stealing of this, that, and the other. So we cut off the tops of some of our weeds, we run in debt as far as we dare for this, that and the other, and promise to pay, when we know perfectly well that unless a miracle occurs we can't do it. When we know that unless our wildest hopes are realized, which seldom are we shall not be able to pay when the time comes. When we know that emergencies are continually arising to prevent us from keeping promises. We cut off the tops of our tallest weeds of desire for this, that and the other but we leave the roots and the most necessary sprouts. We only have it charged when it's absolutely necessary, which in 999 cases out of 1,000 is a mere sophistry. There might be in any life an occasional time when it is absolutely necessary for to have it charged or to borrow, which is the same thing, just as there might come up a weed overnight. But there is never a continued necessity for buying what one has not the money to pay for. Of course, this does not refer to having it charged as a matter of convenience. When one already has in bank the money to pay for it, I refer to the habit of buying today that which one hopes to pay for out of tomorrow's work. The living this week on money one hopes to earn next week. The spending of money which is still on the books. Or even living this week off money we expect to receive on Saturday night. All living ahead of the money in hand, no matter when that money may be due, is done at the expense of that homely plant, the desire to live within your income, the essence of which is honesty. And that plant, dearie, is the only one from which we can distill the essence of honesty. That is why I so strongly desire us to cultivate it. The habit of having it charged is an ugly, gnarled, and distorted weed whose root is the desire for this, that, and the other. Desire which has been permitted to burrow and spread itself until it is in a fair way to completely starve that homely plant from which we distill honesty. The only thing to do is to let die that old root of desire for this, that, and the other. To kill it by refusing to feed it. They say love grows by what it feeds upon. That is the way all desire grows. Until it absorbs everything in sight and dies for the want of other worlds to conquer. Don't you know how? When you get the new chair you desired, the one like Mrs.
Smith, that immediately your room looks shabby and you find yourself desiring a new cushion or two to match, and new curtains, and then a new carpet to take the place of the old one, which looks old-fashioned, now beside the new chair, and a dozen other things. And then when the door is open into the next room that looks shabby, and you desire new things for that, and so your desire for this, that, and the other goes running like a noxious weed in an untended garden all over your house and premises, and yourself and children and husband, until it sucks the life all out of your income and the peace out of your heart and the hearts of those around you. All these things are lovely in themselves, but when purchased at the price of your conscience and the peace of mind of yourself and husband, they are not expedient. That is, they do not speed your sour's expression. They do not help you to express the best of yourself. In other words, they retard your development. It is by the best use of what we have that we learn our lessons and get ready for more things in a higher class. What would you think of a third reader pupil who insisted upon working in high school classes? And yet that is what every one of us does when he insists upon having that for which he cannot pay. And those of us who persist in that course come to a grand smash at last and are set back into their proper classes. Very often they find that class in the penitentiary more often they find it in the lack of faith of their neighbors who have learned by experience their own and each other's not to trust them. So perforce they come down to their class and quit having it charged because nobody will charge it. But he does not even yet live within his means because he wants to. And right action is incomplete unless rooted in strong desire. His heart garden is overrun with those noxious weeds of desire for this that and the other, but he is now so placed that he must root out the majority of them, thus allowing the growth of desire to live within his income, when every attempt to have it charged meets with a cold rebuff one, has an incentive to root out the desire to have it charged. So the desire for this, that and the other, is not only lopped off at the top, but it is starved at the bottom. Paralyzed by fear of rebuffs. I once read a remarkable story about two men who had let their heart gardens overrun with desire for this, that and the other, to such an extent that honesty was a mere gasping rootlet without signs of life. One of these men was sentenced to five years in the penitentiary, which he served after snugly cashing his half of the stolen money. The other narrowly escaped. The one who went to prison hatched, while there a beautiful scheme for getting even with the world. He had been sent to prison for appropriating a paltry little $10,000 while such men as Rockefeller stole millions and were toadied. Now he proposed to get even by stealing a cool half million from the world. Upon his release, he hunted up his old pal, who, after spending his $5,000, had been having a hard time because nobody would let him have it charged and everybody was afraid to trust him to do anything more responsible than janitor work which he had never learned to do. Smith was his name. The other man's name, after his release from prison, was Johnson. Johnson found Smith ripe for the new scheme, which was this. Smith was to go away to a new city where nobody knew him Johnson could not trust himself because his gait reminded the observer of the prison lock stepped. Smith was to change his name. To hire a modest office and pay for it out of Johnson's money, of which a thousand or two were to be banked in Smith's new name, with more forthcoming from Johnson when needed. He was to buy good but plain furnishings and have them charged. And promptly on presentation of the bill, he was to pay with a check. This was done to impress people that Smith bought things and paid cash. If the things had not been charged... Smith would not have been so quickly brought to the town's notice as a man of means and honesty. As soon as Smith's credit was established, he was to begin to borrow money, first small sums, and then larger as his credit grew, every time taking care to pay ahead of time, receiving the regular discount. In short, Smith was to live for five years as a strictly honest man who had everything charged and paid when he said he would, and who was getting rich fast. Johnson calculated that in five years of this sort of living Smith's credit would be good for a cool $500,000 in cash. At the expiration of the five years, Smith was to borrow all he could lay his hands on, and with Johnson, skip for parts unknown. 
The scheme worked like a charm. At the expiration of the five years, Smith could command over $500,000 in cash outside of his flourishing business, which, of course, could not be turned into cash without rousing suspicion of some sort and thus hurting his credit. And all these years, Smith had lived well, though not extravagantly, as another aid in growing his credit. Then, before the date for the final coup, he went to see Johnson, whom he had kept informed secretly of his progress. And what do you think Smith said? His first words were, Johnny, I can't do it. Five years of living like an honest man have made me prize honesty above everything else. I can't throw away the clean credit I have made, nor desert the fine business I have built up. My heart and pride are in it, and to desert now would kill me. And how do you suppose Johnson took it? He drew a long breath and smiled. Smithy, he said, I'm with you. These five years of helping you to be square of taking pride in your success have made me see things I never dreamed of before. Why, Smithy, it's easier to get an honest living than a dishonest one, ain't it? And a feller feels a heap better while he's doing it, don't he? So Smith and Johnson shook hands solemnly and lived honest ever after. Johnson went home with Smith and they worked together to still further build the business and grow an honest credit, which they guarded as the apple of their eye. Smith and Johnson were cultivating an ugly weed, the desire to get even. In order to satisfy this weed, they must have an enormous credit. In order to grow an enormous credit, they must live strictly within their means, seeing to it that their means always kept well ahead of their desire for this, that and the other. By living this way five years, they learned to want above all things to live within their means. They found the noxious weed of desire to get even had lived its short life all weeds are short-lived and died a natural death. Deary, cultivate carefully that homely plant, desire to live within your means. Let nothing hinder, for verily there is no limit to the income and the credit you can grow if only you keep the weeds of this, that, and the other well subdued. And there are a thousand other virtues which will grow alongside the desire to live within your income, which would shrivel and die among the weeds of desire for this, that and the other. But that's another story. Success is my birthright. Everything I touch becomes successful. All I think is success. I feel successful. I speak of success. I think success. I am grateful for the success I've had in my life thus far. Success is my birthright. Success is where I'm headed. Success is all around me. I am known as a successful person. Success follows me around like a shadow. I am grateful every day for my successful life.